I'm going to start out in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I'm going to start in verse 14. No, 13. Yeah, that's a good verse to start with. So 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. The Bible says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an arch, the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, we, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So today I'm going to speak on uh, the resurrection of the dead. And uh, there's two resurrections mentioned in the Bible. And, and so we're going to look at those and see what the difference is between one and the other. There's two. And 1 Thessalonians 4, like starting in 13, is telling us about the first re the, the, the resurrection of the dead. When Jesus returns, um, and everyone who believes in him will, will be raised who, who died. And then the people that are still alive at that time will also be raised, will uh, be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And this is normally known as the rapture, right? Because it's they, they get that name from the Greek where it's being caught up. The rapture means being caught up, right? So this event called the, is called the rapture, but the Bible calls it the resurrection. So because Jesus rose again, even so, because he was our example, that uh, we shall also be resurrected is the promise of the Bible. So, uh, so now if we go to 1 Corinthians 15, that also has talks about the this event, the rapture, the resurrection. So that's uh, a few books to the left in your Bible. So 1 Corinthians, it's the final, it's the second last chapter of the 1 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians 15, I'll let you, uh, give you some time to find that. So I'm going to start in verse 13, 12. Let's start with verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. So it's saying here that the resurrection is very important. If you don't believe that there's a resurrection, there were some people back then that says there were the Sadducees back in the day when Jesus was around, they had the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the Sadducees said that there was no resurrection. We're going to see some of those verses later where Jesus talks to the Sadducees, and they deny the fact that there's a resurrection. So it's saying here, um, some among you are saying that there is no resurrection, but it says here, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ himself didn't get resurrected, and then if he's not resurrected, then we'll there's no point to all of Christianity because he wasn't God, right? It's proof, like, the fact that he was resurrected is proof that he's God, right? So if he rose from the dead, then the Bible says we will also. This is one of the promises of God that because we're supposed to have, we get eternal life when we believe, right? So you may die on this earth, but you will be raised again. That's the Bible's promise. So if we go now to verse... 22, skip forward a little bit, or 21, let's go with 20, verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept, 
For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. Okay, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop here. Um, so it's saying in verse 23, Christ the first fruit, so he was the first resurrected from the dead when he was resurrected in back three days after he, three days and three nights after he, he was buried, after he died. And then it says, afterward, they that are Christ that is coming. So that's telling us that we will be resurrected. Everyone who believes the gospel, everyone who's saved will be resurrected at his coming as well. And then, so I'm going to skip ahead now to verse 50 in the same chapter. Verse 50. Now I say this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, in saying that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, and our corrupt bodies can't, can't enter heaven with it, with an in, in, in a corruptible imperfect body that we have, right? It's a mortal body. So we have to be changed according, according to this. When you're resurrected, you're going to get an incorruptible body and an immortal, an immortal body. So this is the, what eternal life is really, is when you're resurrected, you're going to receive a new, a brand new body that has no infirmities. It's going to be perfect. Just like Christ, when he rose from the dead, he got a glory, he was in a glorified body, so shall also the people who are resurrected when he returns. So we, because in order to enter into the kingdom of God, you, you have to be perfect, right? So we're perfect in the spirit when we get saved. You get Christ's righteousness imputed to you. So you, God sees you as perfect, but then but our bodies, we still have our old bodies, right? So when we get resurrected, then we get our new bodies, and then we can enter the kingdom of God. Now, if we go now to Revelation chapter 20, right near the end of the Bible, Revelation 20, verse 4. I might as well start from... Revelation 20, verse 1. It says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again, 
until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power, hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So this here is the first resurrection. So this is the, re the same resurrection we're talking about in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, when Christ returns and everyone shall be resurrected who believed in him. And it says we're going to reign with him a thousand years. And, and um, it says uh, judgment was given unto them. And even they're going to, some of the saints are going to, are going, are going to judge the world as well, help judge the world. And um, for a thousand years, we're going to be ruling and reigning. And, you, and de depending on if you're getting et any eternal rewards um, for serving God during your time on earth, you, you may be rewarded with like ruling over a country or a city or something like that. We don't exactly know the details of that, but we will find out when, when the time comes. So it says this is the first resurrection. So it says, on such that second death has no power. The second death is um, is when you is is the second death is hell, right? And where it says in Revelation 21, 8, tells us what the second death is. 21, 8, just over a page. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So the second death is the lake of fire where all of the unsaved people are gonna, they're gonna end up. That's, and that's hell, right? So the first, so the people in verse 20, verse six, the second death has no power over a saved person. So you'll, you can never go to hell, it's impossible, right? Second death has no power. So that's the first resurrection. And there's some, it wasn't just in the New Testament that, that we found out about this, the resurrection. There are some Old Testament mentions of the resurrection, which I'm going to look at now. Um, I'm going to save a place in Revelation 20. So I'm going to come back to it later. But for now, I'm going to go to the book of Daniel. In the Old Testament, book of Daniel, chapter 12. Daniel 12, yeah. That's in the, the, in the prophets. Right after Ezekiel, you have uh, Daniel. Ezekiel is a pretty big book. And then Daniel's 12 chapters. So it's right after that. Chapter 12 says, And that time, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never once was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Okay. So this is talking about two different resurrections here. Um, the Michael that will stand up is Michael the Archangel. He's also mentioned in Revelation 12 as when, when, when there's a great war in heaven, that Michael the Archangel fights the devil and he casts him out of heaven. Um, and then it mentions there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. That's the tribulation. And, and then at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. The book is talking about the book of life, where the name of all the saved people is put into the book of life, or you are in the book of life. And if you become unsaved at some point, I think you end up, you're in there by default. Everybody's in the book of life, but then once you commit a sin or something like that, you, you, you could be blotted out. Like if you cross that line, if you become a reprobate, if you take the mark of the beast, then you're blotted out of the book of life. Right? If, you, if you 
die uh, unsaved, if an unsaved person dies, they are blotted out of the book of life. So they're not going to be found written in the book of life. So, and then in verse 2, verse 2 has two parts to it. Some shall awake to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. The, this two halves of the verse is actually taking place a thousand years apart because you've got the first resurrection right after the tribulation and then you've got the second resurrection which is the resurrection of the unjust which is uh, a thousand years later after Jesus returns a thousand years later is this there's a second resurrection we at least a thousand years later we don't know exactly if it's a thousand years or more but at some point then the, all the dead that were unsaved are going to be resurrected and they're going to be judged and we'll see that a little bit later we'll see that where that is and so that's the shame and everlasting contempt so there's those occur at least a thousand years apart it's in one sentence and it's common in the bible that uh, when you're talking about prophecy that uh, sometimes one in one sentence you're looking at different time periods and only because we have the book of Revelation do we know they have the more details on the time of that. So now I'm going to go to Ezekiel 37. One book back from Daniel. Ezekiel chapter 37. set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about and behold there were many very many in the open valley and lo they were very dry and he said unto me son of man can these bones live and I answered O Lord God thou knowest and he said unto me prophesy upon these bones and say unto them O ye dry bones hear the word of the Lord thus saith the Lord God unto these bones behold I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and I will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. And so I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore I prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. And shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land, then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. So, this is talking about a resurrection here. There's, it, there's like a twofold uh, prophecy here. It's sort of symbolic about the restoration of the nation of Israel, which is going to happen at the end of when Christ returns. He's going to restore Israel. Israel is going to be made up of everyone who was saved, who believed in Jesus Christ. It's the Israel of God. It's a, I covered it in an earlier sermon a few weeks ago. It's everyone who believes on Christ is considered the seed of Abraham. So it's that. And then also it's, it's giving you a description of the resurrection of the dead where it con they, they come back to life. So it's, <coughs> it's giving us a description of the resurrection where people are coming back to life 
And uh, even when it says come from the four winds, it's sort of later on we'll look at Matthew tw in Matthew 24. There's something about the four winds as well, and that's to me that's a cross reference. But we're going to see that a bit later. So remember that four come from the four winds. It's interesting. And now and now we'll go to Isaiah 25. A little bit farther back here, Isaiah 25. And this, Isaiah 25, is where in 1 Corinthians it was talking about, it was quoting some scripture about death being swallowed up in victory. And this is where it comes from in Isaiah 25, um, verse 8. He will swallow up death and victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord, we have waited for him, and we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Now, Okay, and now let's just go ahead to Isaiah 26, verse 1. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation, which keepeth the truth, may enter in. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. And I'm going to skip forward to verse 17. So I'll, I'll just cover this first. Uh, so it's saying sal this is salvation, right? And open ye the gates that the righteous nation may enter in. That's I think it's talking about the new Jerusalem, the big, the great city that's going to come down at the after the great white throne judgment when there's a new heaven and a new earth. This is in Revelation the end of Revelation. Um, so it's talking about what happens after the resurrection. And it's saying salvation and trusting in the Lord, telling us that we're saved by trusting in the Lord, not by works. And yeah, for he bringeth down them that dwell in high the lofty city. He layeth it low, he layeth it low even to the ground. He bringeth it even to the dust. The foot shall tread it down, even the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. The way of the just is uprightness, Thou most upright dost weigh the path of the just. Okay, so skipping forward to verse 17. Like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery is in pain and crieth out in her pangs, so have we been in thy sight, O Lord. We have been with child, we have been in pain, we have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth, neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. Thy dead man shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of, her, of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter into thou, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, till the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. So this is talking about the wrath of God here in verse 21. He's going to come out to punish the inhabitants of the earth. But in verse 20, it's saying, Enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy door. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. The word indignation means wrath. It's talking about the wrath. So it's saying we're going to be going into a chamber. We're going to be like, we're going to be like removed from the air from until the, the wrath is finished, right? So just like it says in in First Corinthians, First Corinthians 15, we're going to be resurrected. This is going to happen before the wrath of God is poured out on the earth. It's going to happen after the tribulation and before the wrath of God. Um, so it's this here, verse 20. And verse 19 is talking about the resurrection itself. The dead, my, thy dead man shall live. And even Isaiah there, together with his dead body, shall they arise. arise. And then there's going to be, and the people who are alive are also going to be 
uh, caught up, and so it removes us from the earth so that the wrath of God, so we won't be subjected to the wrath. Because it says, uh, we're not appointed unto wrath, but to salvation. Uh, so that is, that's the main references in the Old Testament to the resurrection. And if I go to Acts chapter 24... Acts 24. That's after the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then you have Acts. It's in chapter 24 there. All right. Acts 24, verse 14. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets and have hope toward God which they themselves also allow that there shall be a resurrection of the dead both of the just and unjust so here's Paul, the apostle Paul here saying that uh, even the Jews believed that there was going to be a resurrection of the dead because it was written in the law and the prophets so they even believed that there's going to be a resurrection of the just and a resurrection of the unjust Okay, now I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 gives us a lot of information uh, on the, the timing of the resurrection, the first resurrection. So if we go to Matthew 24, verse 29. Matthew 24, verse 29. Okay. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So that is the resurrection there. And it's gathering his elect from the four winds. And that is similar to what it said in back in the Old Testament about the four winds, too. So it's, it's definitely a parallel to that. And it was definitely referring to the same event. The resurrection so after the tribulation in those days so that's the first resurrection mentioned there and then we're going to be gathered from the from one end of heaven to the other and if we go to mark chapter 12 that's the next book over mark mark 12 there's a lot more written about the first resurrection than, the, than about the second. So we can see that they're emphasizing that we want to be part of the first resurrection, not the second resurrection. So we're, we're going to look at a bunch of mentions of the first resurrection in the Gospels. So, so Mark chapter 12. <coughs> starting in... Yeah, verse 18. Then come unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. So earlier there was a mention that some people don't believe there's a resurrection. This is them. This is the Sadducees. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother die and leave his wife behind him, and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were seven brethren, and the first took a wife, and dying left no seed. And the second took her, and died, neither left he any seed, and the third likewise. And the seven had her, and have left no seed. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall be, she be of, him, of them? For the seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto them, do you not therefore err, because you know not the scriptures, there neither the power of God? For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, 
but are as the angels which are in heaven. And as touching the dead, that they rise, have ye not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. So the Sadducees were, did not believe that there were even, it was even a resurrection. Even though it was written in the Old Testament, they still didn't believe it. And we're getting some more information there that once we're resurrected, we're not going to be married, nor nobody's going to get married anymore. And anyone who's saved, we're no longer going to be married or given in marriage anymore because we're immortal. We won't need to, we won't need to marry anyone. Basically, it's going to be like the angels in heaven, it says. And there's also some people today that don't, that they don't believe a resurrection. They're called preterists, right? And they believe that the resurrection already took place back in A.D. 70. Uh, or actually, when Jesus was resurrected, there was a few people that came out of their graves at, as well at the time. And they believe that that's the, the resurrection being talked about in the New Testament here. But uh, they... They don't believe it. Like they think everything is past, right? So similar to the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection, and uh, they do greatly err, according to Jesus, right? He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. So there has to be a resurrection. Otherwise, you know, what's the point? You know, there has to be one, right? Because he's not the God of the dead, but of the living. So I'm going to go to Luke 14, one book over. Luke 14. Luke 14, and verse 12 I'm going to start with. Said, he said he also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. So he's talking about when you're having a feast, you know, call the poor instead of the rich people instead of your friends call the blind etc and, and he said you're gonna you're gonna be blessed if you do that and you're gonna be recompensed at the resurrection of the just that's talking about the rewards he will give when he comes back when jesus returns he's going to be giving rewards to those who are saved and that's talking about rewards right there i'm going to go forward now to luke chapter 20 Luke 20. And you're going to see the Sadducees again Luke in Luke 20, starting in verse 27. Then came to him certain of the Sadducees, which deny that there is any resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, okay, this is, this is the parallel passage of that, of that one in Mark, right? So, it's the same thing, okay. Therefore, in the resurrection, okay, so I, I don't think I need to cover that one again. Uh, but in verse um, 35, 34, the children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they that which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels, and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he, yeah, and that's the same thing. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. So we get some more information there about what ha what's gonna, it's gonna be like after the resurrection. You can't die anymore, we have eternal life equal unto the angels and you're not going to be marrying or giving in marriage where you're going to live forever in your perfect body glorified body ok 
Okay, and now that's the end of for Luke. And now it's going to go ahead now to John chapter 5. John, John has, the book of John has a lot of information about the, the resurrection here. Starting in verse 21, John 5. This was just after the Jews tried to kill Jesus because he had broken the Sabbath and said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. So verse 21, For as the Father raises up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That's a, that verse I use out soul winning all the time. It's proves to it proves without a doubt that salvation is a one time event, and as soon as you believe on Jesus, you're believing on the Father as well, and you have everlasting life at that moment in time. You already have everlasting life. You're not going to come into condemnation, and you are passed from death unto life, present tense. So you can never lose your salvation. It's proof that. It's a one-time event. Salvation, some people say salvation is a process, and that's not true. It's a one-time event. You believe, and then you receive, basically. And then verse 25, Verily, verily I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. And hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I can of my own self do nothing, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just. Because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has, hath sent me. So, it's talking here again in verse 29, the resurrection of life and a resurrection of damnation. So you got two resurrections here. And those who have done good are the ones that are believing the gospel. And that's what the will of the Father, as it mentions in verse 30, the will of the Father is in, Luke, in John 6. Now I'm going to go to John 6. Because that's, that's who have done good, is who, whoever has done the will of the Father. Now we're going to see what the will of the Father is in John 6. In verse 39, or 38. Even starting, ver verse 37 is good too. Okay, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. So that there are, proves again that you cannot lose your salvation if you come to Jesus if you are saved he will in no wise cast out and there's no reason you would ever be cast out for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will but the will of him that sent me and this is the father's will which hath sent me that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing but should raise it up again at the last day and this is the will of him that sent me that everyone which seeth the son and believeth on him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last day so that's the will of the father is that you believe on the son and you will be raised on the last day that's that's when the resurrection is called the last day and it's there's also a day called the great and terrible day of the Lord when he comes back to judge the world that's the same day it's talking about the last day so we're going to be resurrected the resurrection is going to happen the rapture, and then the wrath of God will be poured out on the earth. That's what, so that went, that's what happens on the last day. So, and in verse 44, 
No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And that's again, you're going to be raised up at the last day. Um, where it says, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me, draw him. The Calvinists will use that verse all the time, saying, Well, you can't, you know, you can't, you have to be drawn. You can't just believe the gospel and be saved. You have to be drawn. But it says in John 12 that uh, I don't have, to, I don't, we gotta, I don't know if we can find that now, but John 12. Yeah, John 12, 32 says, and if you want to keep a marker in John 6 there, because I'm going to go back to John 6. So if you go 12, flip over a few pages to 12, 32, it says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. So it... It um, disproves the Calvinist doctrines, where it says you have to be you have to be drawn, right? Only the select few are going to be drawn. But it's a, they never quote this verse 12:32, that where he says once he's lifted up from the earth, which is a, re a reference to being on the cross, being crucified, he will draw all men unto me, disproving the Calvinist limited atonement doctrine where it says you have to be drawn, right? So everyone was, will, is going to be drawn. Everyone has a chance of salvation. It's just a matter of believing the gospel. All right, now back to John 6 and now verse 54. It says, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So it's talking about his, you know, the Catholics will take this and say, well, yes, that's the communion where, you know, the, the wafer becomes the actual body of Christ and the wine becomes his blood and then they drink it and eat it. But the, the, Jesus here is, is talking figuratively, not literally eating his flesh, right? He's talking about because in John 1 it says, he was the word of God made flesh. So the word of God, so eat, whoso eateth my flesh is, is symbolic of reading the Bible. Right and believe and uh, reading the gospel or getting the gospel preached to you, and you receive eternal life when you believe it. Um, so it's 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 not a literal. You're not literally eating it in his flesh. Uh, so go now to John chapter ten. Skip forward to John ten. Twenty-seven. Now, some more good verses here about um, salvation. John ten, starting at verse twenty-seven. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. So this is another set of verses here that says we can never lose our salvation. No man can pluck them out of my hand or out of the father's hand. Um, you shall never perish. So, And even you, you yourself cannot pluck yourself out of the father's hand. You, you think you're stronger than the father? No. Even yourself cannot do that. You can't walk, like people are saying that, uh, oh, yeah, you can't be plucked out of your hand, but you could walk away. You could give it up. Uh, it's saying here, no, you can't. Even if you were to walk away and go back to the world, you were, you're still saved. So now I'm going to go to John 14. Skip a little bit, a few more chapters ahead. John 14. starting at verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me, Jesus is talking. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Okay, so it's, it's, he's saying that if, if, he, if he's telling us that he's going to come back, then he's coming back. Right? He's not li he can't lie. Right? God cannot lie. So he says if he's going to prepare a place for us, and that's talking about where we're going to go when the rapture occurs, when the resurrection occurs, to get us out, out of the, to come, bring us off the earth so that the wrath of God can come down. We're going to be going up to heaven to be, you know, safe from the wrath of God while that's happening. And that's the place he's preparing for us. And we'll come again. So he's going to come again and receive them. And then this is similar to 1 Thessalonians 4 where it says we we shall ever be with the Lord when we get when we get raised. So he will be with him. And okay. So if I go to let's get now I'm going to look at some verses about, a few verses about the second resurrection, which is the resurrection of the unjust. So, right, so in John, you don't have to go back there, but John 5.29 says, They that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation, and also in Acts 24, which we already covered, even the Jews believed that there was going to be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. So the unjust, uh, the main verse for the unjust, and Daniel 12, 2 also said that too. Some will be resurrected to life and some to everlasting uh, con contempt, I think it says. So we go to Revelation chapter 20, back to Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse 11. Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So this is the second resurrection, the resurrection of the unjust, or the resurrection to damnation. So they're, actually, they're going to be resurrected, but not to eternal life. They're going to be judged according to their works. Now, this happens a thousand years after the resurrection of the just, at least a thousand years after. We know that it's at least a thousand. Um, and where Satan gets put into, gets bound for a thousand years, right? And then it says, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations. Now I'm back in verse 8 which are in the core, four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So the thousand years happens, the devil is loosed out of his prison, and then he stirs up some trouble. He gets all the nations to, to circle the, in Jerusalem, the city, to try one final push against God, right? To try and destroy everyone. And then God just rains down fire out of heaven and, and, uh, and devours everyone who's at that time coming against God again. And then we have the great white throne judgment. So we don't know, like, after the devil goes into the lake of fire, if there's any time gap between, uh, because in Ezekiel 38, 
that's where this Gog and Magog war is. I'm not going to go there right now, but that's probably another sermon. The Ezekiel 38 war is when this all happens. It's referencing back to that. And then, um, yeah, so the devil gets cast in a lake of fire. And then there's the great white throne judgment. So at least a thousand years later. And then everyone, so there could be some people who miss the rapture um, after the, during the wrath of God. I'm sure there would be some people who didn't take the mark of the beast that are going to believe are going to believe the gospel because the actual there's an angel preaching the gospel during the wrath even it says in, or elsewhere in Revelation. So some people will get, but they but since they missed the first resurrection, they're going to just live out their normal lives and die. And then a thousand years later, like when the resurrection of the unjust happens or the, res the great white throne judgment happens, if they were saved after the first resurrection, they're at that point, if they would be written in the book of life. So they won't go to the lake of fire. They'll receive everlasting life as well. Just they're going to be late. They're going to be like a thousand years late. But, then mo but everyone else is going to be who are not saved, who are unsaved. They're going to be judged according to their works, right? Because they wanted to work their way to heaven. They rejected the gospel. So they're going to be judged according to their works. And, of course, nobody, nobody's works is going to be perfect, right? Everyone, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So if you're going to be judged on your works, you're going to fail that test because everyone's done something that's worthy. It says all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. So just one lie is all it takes to go there. And as long if you're not believing in Jesus, right? And if you're, if you're believing in Jesus, then uh, you have his righteousness imputed to you. So you get to go to heaven. You get eternal life. So, and then one other verse. Uh, you don't have to go there. It's just one verse in Isaiah 26, 14 says, They are dead and they shall not live. They are deceased, they shall not rise. Therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. So it's talking about the, the resurrection of the unjust. They're really not going to be raised to life. They're going to be raised to just to go be cast into the lake of fire if they're not, if they didn't, if they, since they rejected the gospel. All right, so I'm gonna, we're getting there. John 11, I'm going to go back to John chapter 11. Well, I got a few more verses to go. John chapter 11, starting in verse 24. This is about when Lazarus, Martha came and Lazarus, and um, Lazarus, her brother, died, and Martha came to Jesus, and. Um, he, so he came and he was dead four days. So that now in John 11:23, Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. So this is an important uh, doctrine to believe. You need to believe that there is a resurrection. It's, you know, it's essential to salvation. Uh, because if you don't believe there's a resurrection, you think that God's lying to you, then you're not really believing the gospel at that point. You have to believe that he's God, right? So if he's the resurrection, you have to believe in him, right? And it says, even if you're dead, you shall live. He's talking about we're going to die on this earth if we don't live until the rapture. And then, but yet shall he live, right? So we're going to be resurrected. And that's what it means by you shall never die. Because, you know, you're going to die on this earth, but eternally you're never going to die. Because when you die, your, your soul goes to heaven right away. And then you're going to receive your glorified body at the rapture or the resurrection. That's John 11. Uh, go, now I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 
go through 22. Verse 23, starting in verse 23. We see the Sadducees again. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's back to that. Okay, we already, we already covered that, where the Sadducees were asking about, you know, what's going to happen to this hypothetical wife that married seven brothers because each one of them died, and whose wife is she going to be in the resurrection? The Sadducees are denying the resurrection, so they're not saved because they have... If believing the resurrection is essential to salvation, these people, the Sadducees and the Preterists, now we're going to see 2 Timothy. Okay, I'm going to go to 2 Timothy, chapter 2. Second Timothy 2, starting in verse 17. 16, I guess. It says, starting at verse 16, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. So these guys, Hymenaeus and Philetus, which are, were back in, in the Apostle Paul's day, he knew about them, said they were telling people that the resurrection, oh, oh that's already passed, it's, not, it's done, it already happened. Um, and this is similar to the Preterists, right, where they say, oh, it all happened back in A.D. 70, it happened a long time ago. So he's saying here, they've overthrown the faith of some. So it, believing that the resurrection is still in the future is essential to the faith, right? If they don't, they don't believe the resurrection is still to come, they're overthrowing, they're, people are starting to doubt the faith, right? That's what it's saying. They're overthrowing the faith of some people because it's an essential. You have to believe there's a resurrection coming. Otherwise, you know, preterists are saying that it was past. They don't, they're not believing that the promises of God are true, really, because the, the Bible clearly says it's going to be in the future, not, not in the past. So, and now I'm, and we're going to prove that in Romans chapter 4, if we go back to Romans, right after Acts, book of Romans. Romans chapter 4, an important. It's an important verse is about believing the promises of God. So Romans chapter 4. talking about Abraham and how Abraham was saved. It says in starting verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. So here we're seeing that Abraham had to be fully persuaded that God was able to perform what he had promised, right? So if God has promised us that there is going to be a resurrection, we need to be fully persuaded that that is true in order to be saved, right? If you're not fully persuaded in all the promises that are they're mentioned here about the resurrection that Jesus died for your sins on the cross that his uh, you know his, it's his works that uh, save us and believing that his death burial and resurrection that's what saves us and believing that you you're not you will never die you have eternal life and that you will be raised on the last at the last day you have to be fully persuaded that God can perform that that these promises that are in the Bible we need to believe them Right, and then once, you, and if you're fully persuaded that that's true, you get it. It's imputed to you for righteousness. So everyone, and that's and that's Jesus' uh, righteousness, the righteousness of faith by faith. Right. So that's and that is that's all I have for today. Um, I have another 
I was, you know, I don't have, to, I don't have time to go over it, but there's a lot more about this, about the, the timing of when this is going to happen, and there's a lot of, it's, pro, it's a whole other sermon, really. It's a, I'm going to cover it like in a future sermon about the exact timing, because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of things in Revelation, even things that I, I never knew before, that because I've been reading Revelation, I've noticed some things. I'm going to be covering that probably in, a, in my next sermon. Uh, but for now, we need to be fully persuaded that he can perform and that we're going to be resurrected. So I'll finish with the word of prayer and then we'll do another hymn, some hymn a couple a hymn. Um, Heavenly Father, please bless everyone that came out today and bless the congregation and um, you know, bless everyone that couldn't make it out today and you know, hopefully everyone learned something today and uh, let them remember this and let them be fully persuaded that you're able to do what you are saying that you're going to do in the, in the Bible and thank you for the free gift of salvation and we, we, we know we can't get to heaven on our own we need to be saved from our sins that Jesus died for us and in Jesus name I pray Amen.